time is 7 o'clock, and Brother Bruce Freeman will be preaching, and the Daughters of Calvary will be singing. That will be at the Northside Baptist Church this coming Monday night. Well, if you have your Bibles this evening, I think we'll begin first, probably in the Gospel of John. We're going to look at a lot of places tonight. We talked about, we're trying to deal with the subject of missions, and we talked about uh, the message, the true and living God, last Wednesday night. We'll talk about the manual this evening, and that is the one true Word of God. Now, a manual, according to the 1828 dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, defines a manual as a small book such as may be carried in the hand or conveniently handled as a manual of laws. Certainly many of the things that we purchase in the day and time that we live in, they come with what we call an owner's manual. And it's a small book that tell us, tells us how to use that product or how to operate that product or, or how to maintain that product that we have purchased. I was thinking about this today. I was writing this uh, sermon outline. My wife is very good about keeping up with owner's manuals. In fact, she has a a whole file, and everything that we buy that has an owner's manual, she she puts those things in there. That's very convenient. I'm glad she does that. I would lose them in there because I don't ever use them, not until something breaks or tires up. And And then you go get that thing out and see how it works. I hope, I hope we don't do the Bible like that. Let's don't wait till our life breaks or messes up to go get the manual. We ought to have a steady diet of the Word of the Lord to instruct us and help us along the way. That's for sure. Now, I believe the desire of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is that the whole world would hear the gospel. Uh, he said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So I believe it's the desire of the heart of our Savior that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would be proclaimed around the world. I think that's his desire. I think that's his heart. I think that's his wish. And so he has given us a Bible. He has given us the Word of God. And more specifically, he has given us the King James Bible. And this is our manual. This is our guide. This is our road map. This, this tells us uh, about the way, the way to heaven, the way to miss hell, the way to live our lives. And so we're thankful for the Bible. Now, this manual, you've heard these things before. I've probably mentioned this before even, but I like it, so I'm going to mention it again. This manual is a book like no other. It contains 66 books written by 40 authors over a period of 1,600 years. It has 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses made up of 788,280 words. The exact phrase, thus saith the Lord, is recorded 415 times between the covers of this one-of-a-kind manual. I like this. this is, there's an estimated 168,000 Bibles sold or given away every single day. This manual has been translated into 1,200 different languages And the King James Version of the Bible is the only book in the world with over one billion copies in print. Ain't that a blessing? And so God has given us His Word. I made mention just a moment ago that last week when we began talking about this humongous subject of missions, we talked about the one true God. And with the help of the Lord this evening, I want to talk about the one true Word of God. So I'm thankful that the existence of absolute truth. We have that. We talked about the true God last week. We have a Bible. That's the word of truth, and it is inseparable from the true God. In fact, Jesus said in John, when he was praying, in John 17, 17, he said, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Uh, This truth is given to us by our God, and the great thing about our God is the fact that He is a God of truth. We won't turn to these passages. We mentioned them on last week. But Deuteronomy 32, verse number 4, says He's a God of truth and without iniquity. Psalm 31, verse 5, says, O Lord God of truth. Isaiah 65, verse 16, I'll read that whole verse. 
It says that he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless, bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. So we have a God of truth. We are told by the Lord Jesus Christ we can be sanctified through thy truth and that his word is truth. Now, the world that is following after the God of this world, I ask you to come to John. Look at John chapter 8 for just a moment. The world that we are living in is following after the God of this world. And there is very little or no truth at all that is proclaimed in this world that we are living in. And Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse number 44, he said, You're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Look at this. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So there is clearly no truth at all whatsoever in the God of this world. The opposite of that is that our God is a God of truth and that the word that we have, the Bible that we have, is the word of truth. What a blessing. Now, we're living in perilous times. We know that. And we certainly understand, we have no problem with understanding that we are living in an increasingly unhappy world. I've, I've made this comment before as well, and as far as I know, it's still true. I haven't looked lately, but the last time that I saw some statistics on the fact, uh, the, uh, the American population, the populace of America, consumes more antidepressant drugs than any than all the other countries in the world combined and so we we are living in an unhappy country we're living in a in an unhappy world it is an increasingly unhappy place and the reason i believe the reason for that is the father that we get away from god and the father that we get away from the book of god the word of god the more unhappy one becomes in fact, there, there's no peace outside of God. There's no comfort outside of God. There, there's, no, there's, no, there's no truth outside of the Word of God. There's no direction outside of the Word of God. And so we need His truth. Now, the misery is veiled. The, the Bible tells us in, in Hebrews 11, verse 25, that there's pleasure in sin for a season. Now, many years ago, I, I don't, I'm not sure how many, I, don't, I didn't go to a Bible college or a Bible uh, institute or university or anything like that. But I do know that many years ago, the Bible universities, the Bible colleges uh, that we know of, they, they somewhat or some way, well, obviously they started using Bibles that were not God-inspired. There's no doubt about that. But another thing that they started doing a lot of that's very rapid, even in our churches today, is they, they stopped teaching theology and began teaching methodology. Instead of teaching the Bible and let's learning the Bible and knowing what the Bible teaches and what the Bible says, and we do things by the Bible way, which if we're going to have a missions program, it's going to have to be done biblically in the way the Bible says to do it. We're not interested that much in man's ideas and man's methods and man's way of understanding because God's ways and man's ways are contrary the one to another. And even though it doesn't make sense to us, the Bible says one of our, our favorite verses on the uh, board out there now, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And so we need to follow hard after God. Everything that we do should grow out of the truth that we learn from the Bible. Every, every attempt that is made to redefine truth without using the Bible comes up to be a lie. That's all it is. There is no truth apart from God and His Word. He is a God of truth. Now, we believe the Scriptures. We, we believe the, the Scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God. We believe that they are the only rule for faith and practice. We believe in the verbal 
plenary. That means full, entire, or complete inspiration of scriptures. We believe that the authorized King James Version does not just contain God's Word. We believe it is God's Word. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. The Bible is not all that God knows, but God certainly understands better than you and I do. And He has given us all the Word that we need to know. And I'm, I'm glad for that. We, we have everything that we need to receive eternal life and to properly worship and live for our God. And so the Bible is the manual for missions. But it's not only the manual for missions, it's the manual for our church. It's the manual for our lives individually and personally. So I'm glad that we have a Bible. Now turn to 2 Timothy, if you will. And we're going to turn to a lot of places this evening. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you will. We'll read a few verses. We'll look at some things and we'll do that over and over. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou, so that thou is Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, I'm going to uh, several different times tonight, I'm going to read a different passage of Scripture, maybe one verse, maybe three or four verses, and I'm going to give you several things out of each one of those passages of Scripture, several things about the Bible. So in these verses that we just read, these three verses that we just read, we learn five things about the Bible in those three verses. First of all, in verse number 15, we learn that the Bible is a holy book. The Bible says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Now, the word holy means whole, entire, or perfect. It means hallowed, if you will. It means perfectly just and good or set apart for a sacred use. So I'm glad that we have a holy Bible. Now, there, there's without a doubt, there's no doubt at all whatsoever that this is the only book in the world that is entirely holy. Now, I, I'm thankful for authors. I read after uh, lots of different men, and I'm thankful for their work and their labor and them sharing that with us. And there's much truth in all of those books, but there is only one book that is entirely holy, and that is the Bible, amen, the King James Bible. So it is a holy book. Book. Second of all, the Bible points to salvation. Look at verse 15 again. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so this, this Bible is a holy book. This Bible points to the way of salvation. The Bible says in 1 Peter, we won't turn there now, we'll go there later, and chapter 1 and verse 22, uh, it says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfringed love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So the way of salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. We see that in our text. It says, they're able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. But we learn that in the Bible. Therefore, we must be faithful to, to teach the Bible and to preach the Bible that we drive this truth home at home and abroad. Amen. We need the Bible. It points to salvation. Number three, the Bible is inspired or God breathed. Look at verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the Bible, the true word of God, is the very breath of God. We believe that is, that is what is called, we believe in what is called, I mentioned it a moment ago, the verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible. I'll explain that. This is what it simply means. This is it, all 
plenary, all. We believe all the words, the verbal. We believe all the words of the Bible are inspired. We don't think that some of the words are, or a few of the words are, or most of the words are, or all the words except the italics. No, we believe in the verbal, plenary, inspired Word of God. It is a God-breathed book. Amen. Thank God for His Bible. Now, this is the claim of the Bible. We see that here in 2 Timothy 2, 3, 16. Notice also, look at this. I hate for you to turn, but I need you to. Hold your place there and come to Matthew chapter 4. I want to show you this. We'll look at a place in Matthew 4 and in John chapter 6. There's no way I can turn to all the places that I need to turn to, but we'll turn to most of them. The Bible is inspired, or God breathed. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 4, in verse number 4. It says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, notice this, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 63. John chapter 6 and verse 63. The Bible says in John 6, verse 63, Jesus speaking, he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Look what he said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so the, the word of God is God breathed. Come back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now what this means is that God gave his word to human authors and he did, he, you know, you say, well, I, how, how can that be true? All of them wrote with a different personality or a different style or whatever. God didn't, God didn't override their personalities, but he certainly gave them the choice uh, or he gave them the words in which to, to write down. That's for sure. When they had written down all that God had given them in his revelation, they had produced a perfectly inspired record of God's revelation. We have a Bible that is inspired or God breathed. So God breathed his word through human vessels, given the word a perfectly inspired statement of his word to men. Now, number four, fourth thing out of those verses, verse 16, the Bible teaches us, the Bible corrects us, and the Bible instructs us. Look what it says in verse 16. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Thank God for a Bible that teaches us doctrine. Thank God for a Bible that teaches us truth. Thank God for a Bible that corrects us when we're wrong. Thank God for a Bible that instructs us so that we can know the right way. What a blessing. We have a, we have a Bible that teaches, corrects, and instructs us. Most of the time, we're wrong. So I'm glad that we have a Bible that corrects us and instructs us. Now, number five from verse 17. The Bible, the Bible molds us into the person that God wants us to be. Look at verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, that word truly means completely. It means fully or wholly. And uh, the Bible is capable of completely furnishing us with everything that we need to know. It is, it, is, it is completely capable of doing that. Now, here's something I want you to, to notice in this verse before we move on to the next passage. It says that the man of God may be perfect. Listen, you, you read that. A lot of times people read that and they say, well, you know, that, that's for the pastor, that's for the preacher, that's for the missionary or the evangelist. No, sir, that's for you. No, ma'am, that's for you. Young lady, young man, that's for you. It's for all of us. The, the Word of God is to mold us to be what God wants us to be, and that's, that's, that's for all of us. It's not just for those who claim to be preachers or pastors or missionaries or evangelists. God wants all of us to, to come up to our full potential, and we'll only be able to do that by allowing God's Word to make us perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. All right, now turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read another passage, and we're going to look at some things from those verses. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 
The Bible says, let's see, no wonder that's not right. That's 1 Peter. That don't work. Second, I mean, 2 Peter is right. I was looking in 1 Peter. I told you to turn to the right place. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto, verse 19, where unto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, from these verses... Actually, just from verse 21, I'm going to look at three things we can learn from verse 21. First of all, writing the Bible was not man's idea. Look what the Bible says. For the prophecy came not in old time by the, by the will of man. This man didn't just one day decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a Bible. Now, that, that's not the way it happened, friend. It wasn't man's idea or man's will. It was God's will to give us his word in written form. And so this is not something that, that man just came up with and decided he would do. The Bible clearly says it came not in old time by the will of man. Second of all, God used holy men to pin down his word. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake. Now, remember just a moment ago we gave you that definition for holy. It means whole, entire, or perfect. It means hallowed or perfectly just and good or set apart for a sacred use. Listen, God used holy men before and God uses holy men today. You want to do something for God? You want to live your life in such a way that God can use you. I, I realize that the Bible says that all of our righteousness is filthy rags. I, I get that. I know that none of us are without sin. I understand that. But the Bible clearly teaches that we are to live our lives in such a way that's pleasing to God. We, we certainly ought to be living way better than we were before. And the, the more you're in this thing and the longer you're in this thing, the cleaner your life ought to get. Amen. And God uses those men, and again, it's not just men. If you want God to use you, live a clean life. You want God, you want to do something with your life for the Lord Jesus Christ, then, then get your vessel in such a shape that he can actually use you to do something for him. He has used holy men before. He still does that today. Number three from verse 21. The Holy Ghost moved holy men to write the very words that God wanted written. Notice the end of the verse. But holy men of God spake as they were, I want to focus on this word, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Listen, God moved men to do something for him. I still believe that God is in the business of moving men's hearts in a direction to do something for him. You, you can label it. It has all kind of labels. You can put any kind of label that you want to do on that. I, I don't pretend to know how all that stuff works. I just know that God will begin to work on your heart and impress upon your heart and will begin to move you in the direction that he wants you to go if you'll be willing to follow him. God moved these men to write the very words of God. Boy, I'm glad he did that, aren't you? I'm glad that those men were willing to be moved. If God wants to move you to do something for him... I'm not talking about moving out or moving over or moving somewhere else. I'm talking about God moving your heart to do something for him. Maybe it's your neighbor that needs a, a witness or maybe it's a ministry that the church has that you want to get involved in and you've known for a long time you need to get involved in but you keep ignoring that moving that God's doing in your heart. Let God do something for you. Let God do something with your life. Come to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Just one verse here, John 5. I'm going to read verse 39. Now, I'm going to do that because I'm just going to read that one verse. But I will tell you this. Before you get to verse 39, Jesus started talking to the Jews in this passage all the way back in verse number 19. And so I'm going to read this one verse, verse 39. And we'll see three important things that we can learn from this one verse. Look what it says. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, 
and they are they which testify of me. Now, first of all, Jesus called the copies of the manuscripts that Israel had, he called them scriptures. In John 5 and verse 39, when Jesus said, search the scriptures, they didn't have the New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament manuscripts, and Jesus said that Old Testament is also the Word of God. Aren't you glad that, that the Old Testament is the Word of God as well as the New Testament is the Word of God? The manuscripts that our King James Bible came from are Scripture. Amen. What a blessing. And so Jesus called the copies of manuscripts that Israel had Scriptures. Second of all, Jesus recommended searching the Scriptures. If Jesus recommended searching the Scriptures, I think it would be a good idea if you and I spent some time searching the Scriptures, wouldn't you? And uh, I think it would be very beneficial to our lives if we spent some time searching the Scriptures. Now, a third thing he said in that passage, he said the Scriptures testify of Him. You've heard this saying a lot. I've made this statement several times myself. The Bible is a Him book. It's all about Him. From the Old Testament, the New Testament, even the Old Testament scriptures, which is what we're, Jesus is making reference to here, he said, those things testify of me. Amen. And so the scriptures reveal Jesus to man, and that's why it's so important that the Bible is the manual in all of our endeavors, in all of our ministries, as the Bible has to be uh, what we preach, what we teach, what we use, because the Bible reveals God to men. Now come to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, we're going to read two verses. Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 17, I'm sorry if I said 10, I meant 17. Acts chapter 17, we'll begin reading in verse number 10. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those, than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And so the Apostle Paul here, he is bragging on the believers at Berea for searching the scriptures. And this, from this passage of Scripture, we, we see three things. First of all, it is noble to read the Bible every day. The Bible said these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily. They were more noble. It means that they, it means, the word noble means great. It means elevated or exalted. And so it wasn't that they were better people, they're better equipped, they have more knowledge, they're, they're more ready available, their lives are more pleasing to God because they spend time in the Bible. Now listen, there, there's, there's no doubt that all of us have some kind of daily routine in our life. There's something, oh, I, 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 I could be wrong, but I'm almost certain that there's probably some things that each one of us do every single day of our life. I doubt there's very many of those things that would be more important than us making it a daily routine to read the Bible. Amen. It, you want to be a noble person? Spend time in the Bible. Search the scriptures on a daily basis. And so it's noble, noble to read the Bible every day. Second of all, second thing we learn from this passage is the Bible will shed light on preaching and teaching. Notice what it says, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Their minds were ready to receive the word because they spent time in the word. A lot of times the reason, I'm, I'm not being critical, I'm being truthful. A lot of times the reason you can't get anything out of preaching is because you never spend any time in the word. You, you, can't, you can't follow along, you can't keep up, you don't know what the teacher or the preacher's talking about because you've wasted your whole life watching TV or playing on social media and you have no idea what the Bible says. But if your mind is doused in the Word of God, then when the preachers are preaching, you will be more inclined to have some insight into what is being taught and preached from the Bible. It's difficult to get your mind on teaching and preaching when your mind has been on everything else all week long. 
You, know, you want to have a better service Sunday morning? Spend time Saturday and Saturday night in the Bible. Spend time praying. You want, you want to have a better service on Wednesday? Spend some time on Sunday evening. You, you don't have to spend that whole afternoon taking a nap. Spend some time reading your Bible. Spend some time praying. Same thing. You ought to do it every day. But you get, you get so much more out of the preaching. The Bible will shed light on preaching and teaching. Number three, I like this. The Bible will tell you the truth. Verse number 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. Look, whether those things were so. They didn't just take the apostles' word for it. They searched the scriptures to see if what they were teaching were so. And here's the thing. We're, we're teaching in the book of Acts, and we have been for, uh, for some time, and we've made mention on several different occasions that every time the book of Acts mentions scriptures, they don't have the New Testament. It's talking about the Old Testament. And so they were searching the scriptures to see if the Old Testament scriptures, to see if the things the New Testament apostles were teaching them were so. Ain't that a great book? Amen. And so may the Lord help you and I to understand that the Bible will tell you the truth. Now, I told you a moment ago we would come to 2 Peter. Come to 2 Peter chapter 1. We was in 2 Peter a moment ago, weren't we? We're in 2 Peter again. <clears throat> chapter 1 this time. Second Peter chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1, I did the same thing again. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, of course, we know that Peter here, he is... Uh, recounting uh, the time when he was on the Mount Transfiguration. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 17. It's also recorded in Mark and Luke as well. And so he is making mention of this here, and he's writing in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 in these verses of Scripture. And there are four things that we can learn from those last two verses, from verses 19 and 20. First of all, Peter stated that the Bible is more sure than what could be eyewitnessed. That, that is very important. The Bible is more reliable than what you can see with your natural eye. In fact, we, we are commanded to walk by faith and not by sight. And, of course, that faith is in, we're to have more faith in what thus saith the Lord than what we can see with our own eyes. Peter, Peter made mention of that. Now, second of all, it is well to study and heed the word. Look at verse 19. Whereunto you do well that ye take heed. You want, to do, you want to do well in your Christian life? Take heed to the Word of God. You want to do well in your personal life? Take heed to the Word of the Lord. You want to do good? You want to, you want to do well with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Take heed to the Word. You want to do good? You want to do well as an employer, as an employee? Do, take heed to the Word of God. And it, it'll help us, amen. You want to do well as a parent, a spouse, a sibling? Take heed to His Word. Number three, the Bible shines light on dark subjects. Verse number 19 again, as unto a light that shineth in dark places until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. So the Bible shines light on the dark places in our heart. Uh, the Bible shines light on dark places in our lives the, the, uh, it, it, by offering comfort. The Bible shines light on our lack of understanding. We, we're thankful for that. Number four, the Bible is not subject to man's opinion. Verse 20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Listen, the Bible is authoritative. Authoritative means having due authority. It means positive, having legal power or command to act. 
And so the Bible is authoritative. Man, uh, man in his lust for money and Satan and his desire to corrupt the word of God has put forth all kind of, of corrupt interpretations of the Bible, man's interpretation of the Bible. But I'm glad that they will never do away with the word of God that's forever settled in heaven. They may sell a lot of books and call them the Bible, but I'm glad we, uh, we have the truth in the word of God and we must always have the truth above all of our thoughts, ideas, or feelings. Thank God for the Bible. Now, by stating that we believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God, and the only rule for faith and practice that stands true that the Word of God is exact. Now, I finally got to the message, but it's only five. All that was introduction. There's only five quick points, and so it won't be long. But the Word of God is exact. Now, since God chose the men He wanted to use to pin down the words He wanted to say, we must believe that God said what He meant and meant what He said. I believe that, don't you? Now, every word of God is exactly the right word. You can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8 if you want to. While you're turning there, I'm going to mention Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 5. It'll be a verse that you recognize. Now, don't y'all, don't y'all get bummed out on me because I said I just got to the message. The introduction was a lot longer than the message is going to be, I hope. I threw that in there because my wife tells me that I tell lies when I say that kind of stuff. Now, I mentioned the Word of God is exact. Every Word of God is exactly the right Word. The Bible says in Proverbs 30 and verse number 5, Every Word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Every Word, not some of the words, not a few of the words, not select words, not part, but every Word is pure. Now, I asked you to turn to Deuteronomy 8. Look at verse number 3. I'm interested in the end of the verse, but we'll read the entirety of the verse. It says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. Look what it says, That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And so... The forever settled word is not swayed by what we think about it, amen. It is exact, meaning that it is precise, it is correct, it is punctual, it is on time. There, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no gray area, amen. It is the exact word of God. Now, we was in 2 Timothy chapter 2 just a moment ago. Come, but we was in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 2. So I told you it would be short. The word of God is exact. The word of God is exhaustive. Now, since God said what he meant to say, we must believe that his word is all we need. He said all that needs to be said about any subject. Now, obviously, there are many subjects in the Bible that we wish we had more information about. There's many subjects in the Bible that we wish God would have given us more information about. But God has given us all that we need to know. We have his complete book. and We can trust the Bible and depend upon it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So study is work. Study is continual work. And when we get saved, the Bible, uh, God made us his workmanship. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. So we are to, this verse of Scripture says that we are to uh, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. So study makes us unashamed. Rightly dividing makes us doctrinally correct. Man, if we ever been a time we need that, that's today. That's for sure. And so the Word of God is exhaustive. It's, it's complete. It is involving or dealing with anything and everything relevant to the matter at hand. Now, come to Psalm chapter 12. This is a very familiar passage for you. The Word of God is exact. The Word of God is exhaustive. The Word of God is eternal. Psalm 12, we'll read it in a moment. The Word of God is eternal. Now, since God said what he meant to say and said all that needs to be said, we must believe that God is able to preserve his word. Now, what good would it do for God to inspire his word and say everything that needs to be said 
and then allow them to be destroyed and causing the word of God to become extinct. That wouldn't make any sense at all. And so God preserved his word. God promised to preserve his word. And if he didn't preserve his word, he lied to us. And we know that he is the God of truth and there is no, no lie in him. We know that. Psalm 12, look at verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So to preserve means to uphold. It means to sustain, uh, to, uh, to sustain or to keep in a sound state. It means to keep or defend from corruption. I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ has preserved his word. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. I don't, I don't think we fully enjoy that statement to the fullest. I mean, every single morning for over 6,000 years, the sun has rose and sat and the moon has come up and the, and the tides have changed and, and all these kind of things. And all of a sudden, one day the Bible said that heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my word's not going to pass away. And so what a blessing it is to have the Bible. So the Bible is exact. The Bible is exhaustive. The Bible is eternal. So here's, here's the important one of, all of those are extremely important, but as far as missions is concerned, and that is the fact that the Bible is evangelistic. Now, uh, the Bible not only reveals God to man, but it also reveals mankind to man. The Bible tells us of the holiness of God, but it also tells us of the unrighteousness of man. The Bible tells us of the faithfulness of God. It also tells us about the unfaithfulness of man. And so uh, the Bible doesn't stop with identifying man's problems and man's needs. Thank God for that. The Bible also gives us the cure for the sinfulness of man. And so we're grateful for the Bible. The Bible tells us much about many topics. The Bible tells us about science. It tells us about medicine and geography and history and family and relationships and religions and all of that. But ultimately, the Bible is a book about Jesus. And so God's word tells us about God's son and his love for the world. He had a very humble beginning. He lived a life that was without sin. He died bearing our sin. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. The third day he got up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And so the Bible points men to Christ. And that's why it is our manual for missions. It is evangelistic. That means persuading men to Christ. And of course, there is numerous Bible verses that you could use under that topic. Now, just one more because it's easy to fit in with an E. The Bible is exact, it's exhaustive, it's eternal, it's evangelistic, it is edged. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vine of son of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so the word of God is edged. It is sharp. Now here's the conclusion. <clears throat> I'll give you four things quickly. As the engrafted word, it is to be received. James chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness of superfluity and naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So the word of God, the engrafted word, is to be received. The faithful word is to be held fast. Titus 1.9 says, holding fast the faithful word. May the Lord Jesus help you and I to hold fast the faithful word. Number three, as the word of life is to be held forth. Philippians 2.16 says, holding forth the word of life. As the word of truth is to be rightly divided. We used that verse of scripture early Earlier, 2 Timothy 2, 15, study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the manual for our life, the manual for missions, the manual for the church is the Bible. It's about the Lord. It teaches us the way of salvation, the way of eternal life. It teaches us how to treat each other and treat all the relations in our life and how to live our life in such a way that's pleasing to the Lord. Thank God for the Bible. Father, we thank you for your word. 
I pray that you will help us to hide your word in our heart, that we might not sin against thee, as the Bible teaches us in the book of Psalms. Help our church, Lord, we have many needs, and we need your help in each of these needs and situations. Many things mentioned tonight, prayer requests that we certainly need some, some grand intervention from the Lord in, and we pray for that. I pray, Lord, for... Bible Institute tomorrow night. She helped Brother Kyle and the Bible Institute there and the ministries tomorrow evening, Saturday, back here on Sunday. Help us, Lord, to be pleasing to you. And we'll sure thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.